that. A very good afternoon and welcome to Safari Lives here in the Greater Kruger National Park. I'm so glad you're all with us. If you are not too familiar with the situation, you know that to send in those questions and comments through the hashtag Safari Live or on the YouTube chat stream. So we've got myself here, Rusty, I'll be hosting this afternoon, and we've got Owen behind the camera, and then also on Drive, we have Lauren and Pat and Sydney, who is on the bushwalk. And it's just pretty impressive gear Sydney has on. I think you better look out for that. So today's topic, before we go and investigate our normal characters out there, is are they present or are they missing? We are talking about the migratory birds of this area. Now, we will go into more in depth later into that and see what we know about that. So, yes. So, well, <laughs> that happened very quickly. So, while we are discussing bird, let's go over to Lauren, who has already got a surprise for you. Well, we can go around, right? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We do have a princess very close by here. Um, princess Lalamba. I'm just going to try and get the best position in for Craig because typical leopard fashion, she has obviously moved off back a lot. Okay, Craig's telling me to go back, so I'm going back. Oh my goodness, can you believe that? Okay, so we're going to try and relocate her. And as we do that, just for my name is Lauren and on camera I have the one and only Craig who has been re newly nicknamed Batters by James which I think is just amazing. Okay so Princess Tlalamba is in here so we're just going to slowly go around because this is the exact area I found her. Oh there she is, there she is. I'm actually just going to turn off the car so you can get a glimpse. She's walking across, I'm going to try and figure out where she's going because recently she has been very skittish. I haven't, well, I think she's been skittish for some time now. Really don't want to start her with her with the vehicle. Okay, she really is moving off now, which is our cue to also try and see if we can follow her a little bit. But I am trying to keep my distance because the other day she did get startled by two vehicles completely accidentally. We just drove and she was there. It wasn't um, intentionally at all. And she got a little bit startled, which is why I'm gonna try and keep my distance with the vehicle. But this may be, oh my goodness, where are you going girl? Oh, she's running. Okay, looks like we're going to have to reverse and go around the long way. Where's she running to? So while I search and try and locate this princess again, we're going to send you across to the bushwalk to say good afternoon. What a beautiful afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Sydney Fumurani, Mikosi, and I'm coming to you live from the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park here in South Africa. Why am I saying it is a lovely day? Because I am taking into consideration the celebration of the bees. Today is bee day and I am left with no option but to dance and celebrate this very special day as the energy I've got today is indirectly coming from the bees. If it was not because of their contribution, I was not going to be energetic as I am. For in case if you need my attention, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube, chat stream That's, those are the bees. So the bees are so amazing and they even got their own dance, which is called a waggle dance. 
the temperature is nice and hot at the moment and these kind of temperatures they do facilitate the reproduction of the bees because if the temperature is is very low and it's raining too much they don't really have a lot of babies but when it's hot like this is when they can multiply so my plan this afternoon is to look for the bees and all the other interesting pollinators. So now let's cross over to Lauren who is searching for the beautiful leopard. Okay, so we've got her in our view. It's definitely not gonna be the best view. Let's just see what my amazing batters can do. Can you work with that, Craig? She's making... Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Isn't that the best view you've ever seen of a leopard? <laughs> She's making it really difficult. There you go. She's on the move again behind a termite mound. Oh, okay, I'm just going to try and navigate out of here again while thinking about where I'm going to go because she's really not making it easy. I can't believe we just found her. For the past two days, we've been trying to locate this princess and here she is right in front of us, going off into the thicket, trying to give us a tandy slip. But we're gonna try and keep up with her as much as we can at the moment, but this is not gonna be easy. I'm sure she will just sit down at some point once she finds a nice shady spot. Alrighty, so again, we're going to keep looking and for now, we're going to send you across to Patricia. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Safari Live with an S on the end of it, making it Safari Live's episode 49. My name is Patrick, and joining me today on camera is Seb, and we are coming to you live from the Juma Game Reserve on the outer western side of the Kruger National Park. Now, this afternoon, I am checking back, <coughs> excuse me, I am checking it back up on Tandy because I heard she has crossed back into the property. So this morning, I was with her for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, and then she crossed over into the southern property where we could not go. But I did hear from Herbie, who you should all know as our game scout, and he said that she, he saw her back down this way. So I'm just doing a little bit of a loop around this area to see if I can pick up on, well, I mean, ideally just the cat herself or even a track or some sign that she has been back around. It's very nice to be with her this morning. And there was also, uh, I had heard that there was some alarm calls down at the Voyatella Dam. So we may follow up on that one as well. But it's good that Lauren has found Tulalumba, but it also puts the pressure on me. Now I kind of have to find Tandy, don't I? But also Rusty is in the tent and talking about birds. So if I do see any birds this afternoon, I will definitely also stop for them. Although it's been pretty quiet. It's quite a still afternoon. There's not a lot of movement in general. There's no real wind. It's quite calming. It's a very relaxing, nice, beautiful afternoon. Weather-wise, it is perfect. It's just at this cruising pace, it makes this slight breeze. And in the uh, afternoon sun, it's very, very pleasant. So I am going to be kind of just cruising and hopefully finding something. Sometimes it gets a little bit exciting, you know, when you want to find something. And that means that you subconsciously speed up a little bit. But uh, it's one thing I definitely learned in the Mara was to just take it slow, just uh, really observe what's going on around you and a lot of the time you'll have good fortune. What's that? It's an Impala. Hello, Mr. Impala. How's rutting going? <laughs> 
Alrighty, well, I'm going to uh, continue my search for Tundi, and in the meantime, let's send you back to the tent with Rusty and his birds. Isn't that incredible? I do apologize about the crash, guy, but we seem to have little gremlins sneaking into our lines. But yes, isn't that stunning? Lauren managed to find the princess in such a short time. We have been looking a few days to catch up with her, and then Pat this morning managed to find Tundi. It looks like the newbies need to be setting their own tracking book for a lot of the older guides around here because we've been looking a few days for these the cats but they managed to find them all with one day but while we're talking about the cats let's go and talk about the birds who is present and who is missing it is one of my favorite topics and i've got so intrigued into how these birds who is not here during the winter and who has left so my, migratory migra migration in general with birds is incredible the distance it covers the whole reasoning behind it and who goes and who doesn't and what has been changed in that time frame because we have got so much clim climate change in the process as we speak who's to blame i don't want to go there so we are looking at a huge change in some of the birds patterns but we are going to concentrate on more on ones we are familiar with so I'm just going to go and show you a map of the normal migratory routes of some of the birds in the area now we are looking at Africa in general and the birds that migrate from Kruger National Park out across the ocean now there are the Palearctic routes that cover a massive massive distance throughout one year sorry that was not supposed to stop right there i seem to <laughs> there we go i'm just going to pause it right there so we've got the subcontinental nomads that is more so it's talking about birds that literally go around uh, travel towards kruger national park within to when the food is available but when we're talking about paleotic migrants we are talking far excessive thousands and thousands of kilometers across so we're going to keep playing this clip so we've got the paleotic eastern route we have the paleotic central route we have the intra-african migrants that don't go further than central africa and m migrate back down for the summer and then we've got the paleotic western route now the birds vary from place to place and species to species and then we've got the altitudinal migrants that just go from the low fight to the high felt so where we are we're sitting at about 480 meters and then when we're talking about altitudinal they go up to higher altitudes so that is the migratory route patterns of the birds that we have now we have a game for you to play now it's guessing who is here who is present and who is not now we are going to play another short clip of the birds that or just a few species that we know and I'm sure most of you know or who is here and who is gone. So we have this one, the steppy eagle, missing or present. We have the barn swallow or the European swallow, is it missing or present? We have the Wilberg's eagle, is it missing? Or is it present? And my favorite, the Woodlands Kingfisher. Missing or present? The Levalence Cuckoo. Not my favorite birds, just because what they do. Missing or present? And the Deirdrick's Cuckoo. Are they missing or present? And then the African Spoonbill. Come on, I can give a little wink there. And the African Harrier Hawk. Another little wink. Let's see. Please, it's a hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat stream. Let's send in those answers. That is the game we're going to play, and I'll go into more in depth as the time rolls on here. So that is how it works. We know it is winter here now, and in parts of Europe it's warming up, and most of the migratory birds have settled in already or already started to build nests of their own to settle in for the summer in those areas. So it's a very, very interesting 
topic when it comes to migra migration in general and how many thousands and thousands of kilometers it takes. Let me just give you a rough estimate. Sorry, I have a board here that is filled up with random information, but we're just looking at the birds of fame just to give some indication of what happens out here. Now, it's not so much birds that come here, but birds in general. We're looking at an Arctic tern. Now, we don't get that bird here. That's pretty thing. But that is 50,000 kilometers. It travels 50,000 kilometers. And from the northern Arctic and then down to the Arctic dark ice cap. So it's 50,000 kilometers. Now you have to think of where the birds we have just shown you, where have they gone? Are they present or are they not? So while, we, while you send in those answers onto hashtag Twitter, go and let's go over to... I think it was Lauren and see what her leopard is getting up to. We are still looking for the very interesting small bees here in the area. There's different types of bee here, bees here in Juma and I've seen a hive. I think I know about two different hives here in the area and I'm sure those are the hives who are responsible in order to breed all these trees and all these grasses for all these different animals to eat. And now let's quickly go to Lauren. We finally caught up with our girl who is currently in the middle of a standoff with a very large male kudu, which is interesting because Kalamba is still very, very small. Is that a Nyala. Kudu. You can barely see my monitor because the screen, the sun is so bright and Kalamba's a little bit up ahead of her. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm trying really hard not to startle her. She's a bit like her mother, a bit like Tandy, and she seems to just slip away and completely disappear out of her grasps. She had us going round in circles there and she popped out again on the road. So you can see she's lying down on the grass just staring at this kudu up ahead, which is far too large for her but she's obviously very very interested very alert and she will absolutely know it's too large for her but she's still having a little bit of a stare out competition and look at those fabulous ears it's one of Kalamba's okay we're gonna follow it's one of her key identification features her big ears I personally fear her ears are too big for her face Little Swift is asking if Columba's fully grown or will she get bigger? I, she's, she's already got a lot bigger, especially since the last time I saw her, but I do think she will get a little bit bigger more, but I don't think it will necessarily be, <laughs> look at her, it will necessarily be in height. I think she will just, oh, she's gone on full stock mode. Columba girl, look at that. Body down to the ground, shoulder blades up. But yeah, I think she will fill out a little bit more, but not by much. She's already grown a lot. So I don't really feel anything's going to happen at the minute. I think she's just very aware that there's antelope species up ahead and she's just assessing the situation around her. And believe it or not, those who were watching a few days ago when I had Kalamba, oh, she's on full stop. This is exactly the same area. I don't believe she's left this area the past few days. We just haven't been able to see her. I don't know if you agree with me about the ears. Okay, she's gone really low to the ground now. So if we don't move, we're going to lose her. Now, she is familiar with cars, vehicles. She just likes to give us that brush off that she knows she can do so well. But the minute she darts off into the thicket here, we probably will lose her. She's very camouflaged, very sleek and slender. And once she puts that belly to the ground, she's off. Mishman is saying there could be younger kudu around. She's off again. Yep, that's correct. There could be. I can't see them at the minute, but there absolutely could be. She's really interested, isn't she? 
It seems to be something off on the left that's attracting her attention. But yes, Mishman, I, I actually don't know what it is. I, I don't have any anything in my line of sight. Okay, I'm going to move forward, try and see if we can catch up with her. God, I've got my work cut out for me today, haven't I? I can see her going, oh, she's picking up pace. Oh, Kalamba, where are you off to? She's going in. She's walking alongside us, but off in the thicket. Don't tell me I've lost her already. Where are you? Oh, there she is. Okay, I'm just going to try. Oh, she's going in. Okay. We are going to try our best to follow her. It's very thick in here. I'm not 100% sure we're going to be able to do this. No, nope. she's moving this way again. I can see her. Okay, so we're going to just try and keep following her. She's walking the same way as us, but just a little bit off. So while we keep tabs on our girl here, we're going to send you back across to Sydney. I just got hooked by the <laughs> buffalo thorn here, uh, but now I'm fine. I, I am back now. With <laughs> Something just happened there. Buffalo thorn is called a blink blood of big in Africans. It's like a wait a bit tree. So I had to wait a little bit because of that. You can see that buffalo thorn is there now. We are still heading uh, to one of the hives to see if maybe we can enjoy a good sighting of the bees but while we are heading there i want to show you what has been happening kuchava the one we have not seen for a while now has been spotted doing something interesting there was great excitement when we found kuchava feasting on an impala ram just east of torchwood camp Fully aware of the risks associated with not hosting her meal, Kuchava wasted no time filling her belly. Strangely, the leopard left her kill before it was halfway finished. Her belly perhaps showing signs of suckle marks and therefore a new generation. It's very nice to see these leopards having something and especially something to eat. So unfortunately they cannot spend much time without having a meal. And if that happens, it means they must have to be able to run very fast because they become lightweight. And the chances when they're getting hungry, the chances for these leopards to catch are getting higher because that is when they can be very much strong, lightweight and dive and be able to tackle a prey. Maybe the bees sometimes get confused and land and try to land on lepers because of their shining spots like flowers. <laughs> so now let's quickly go back to Rusty, who's got the migratory birds. So he is looking for those bees and did you not see Kuchava? She has definitely got something going on there. If not, we can't wait to see those cubs whenever she presents herself. Sorry, the wind is taking over here. So we are going to go back to our migratory routes and who is here and who is missing. So if any of you are still wondering who they were, we're talking about this. Oh, gotta go back to the beginning. We're talking about the steppy buzzard. Is it present or is it missing? Is it the barn swallow? Is it here during winter or is it venturing abroad for the summer? We've got the Wilberg's eagle. Is it here or is it gone? With the Woodlands kingfisher? Hmm, could be here, could be gone. The Levalence cuckoo, the Dedrick's cuckoo, the Spoonbill, or the African Harry Hawk, or also known as Gymnogene. So if any of you have any ideas or questions about them, where are they, what they're doing, where are they right now, in, are they here in Africa, or have they crossed the seas for greener pastures? So please, if you do know any of these answers, please send them through to the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, and we will try answer them. So... Do 
James is asking which one of our birds goes the shortest distance. Well, you're looking at the altitudinal migrants. So there, I'm not going to give any of the games away, but the altitudinal migrants, there's quite a few of them, but they go from the high, low altitude to high altitude during the summer months to the winter months or even the reverse roles. So the exact birds, I'm not going to give any just away yet, any names or anything like that, but I will follow on shortly. But we do have one bird in particular that is well known in this area as well all the way in Kazakhstan and that my friend is the steppy eagle. It is a, quite a large eagle very similar to the Wilbergs, very similar eating habits and they are one of the most extraordinary migratory birds that we are going to talk about today. Now we're going to play a little clip about them and that is one impressive eagle. Now this bird we can talk about for days but the general rundown is they are, take it one guess, they are not here at the moment. They are already, <laughs> I'll show you on the map here, sorry about my poor quality map, but in summer months they are down below the Sub-Sahara. They are down here but for the summer months winter months here, they go all the way across, they're one of the eastern migratory routes and they go all the way up to Kazakhstan around that area, China and that is where they nest for the summer. Now that's a long long way, that's incredible distance and then they pretty much spread out in that time for the first couple of months during summer where they nest all the way up in Russia. Now Russia gets extremely cold in winter so by the time winter sets in there they move either back down to sub-Sahara back to us where we hopefully find them next summer or even some come down to India where they have been known to nest or to stay there. So they spend most of their breeding time up in Kazakhstan Russia area. So that's an astounding and sounding bird. So that's your Palearctic Eastern Root Migrant and that is one of your furthest birds that we get that from come from the Kruger National Park. Now it's incredible how these birds can do it. It's, it still blows my mind and there's so much to learn about that. There's so much that still needs to learn and there's so little research done. So I've got friends in the bird industry what we call twitchers and they have been filling up uh, sending me messages and emails about what they've seen where a lot of birds are going but everything is changing nothing is exact so you're looking at roughly 4.5 billion birds travel this uh, travel each winter and summer between Africa and Europe 4.5 and that's 185 different species of bird now like I said we're only talking about the few the steppy eagle being one of them. So the next bird of choice does anyone know? Come on there is another bird out there that we know of very well and some of you get it up in Europe that is your barn. I'm just gonna pause this for a second Chris you're asking all have gone but one is that the steppy or the swallow? There is a variety of different birds, so you're talking about which one has left. But on to the barn swallow. These barn swallows, going to play it again, they've also got a very extraordinary route. We do find them here in summer, but in the winter period they disappear for warmer and greener pastures. They go from Sub-Sahara. Now there's a couple of them that roost near Durban that I have friends down there that see them every time they come down for the summer and they roost along the waterways there. But they go on the western route all the way up and they spread out throughout Europe where they nest and breed. If any of you do have them nesting or breeding in your area as we speak please let us know because it'll be quite nice to understand if they actually got there yet because weather does play a vital role in all of this so it's very difficult to say if they have got there yet or not so while we 
keep concentrating on what the birds are going up to. Let's go over to Sydney, who is on Bushwalk. I have got uh, this very beautiful dead tree at the moment, which is a very suitable place for the hive. I'm very sure these kind of bees, if they come and see this place, we might find them here one of the good days. So the bees, I want to tell you something interesting about them. You know, the honey from the bees is very medicinal. When I grew up, uh, when I'm having problems with things such as flu, the elders used to go out and get the hives so that they can get us the honey to come and eat. And sometimes they bring the lava from these bees and cook them for us to eat while we were still very young. It was not bad, and you will see there's quite a lot of milk on them. Uh, what they secrete the body as you're eating is very much milky. And here I will tell you something. The bees, when they are threatened by other insects, the insects such as the ants, they have got a very interesting anti-predatory strategy. When the ants goes in there, you will see the bees doing something like vibration of the wings, like zzzz, when they're just going around and around at the same place. When they're doing that, they're generating more heat, and more heat to, uh, to, to such an extent that these kind of predators coming in can get bent right in the hive. So these bees can be able to rise the temperature in order to kill what is coming to attack them. They can cook the ants when they come in there. Isn't that amazing? So you can see they are very tiny little insects, but they are so very much well equipped and very clever. When these bees are flying and come to these trees, they have got baskets on their legs. And then they fly and carry the pollen. Pollen is these very bright and yellowish things where they take from one stigma to the next stigma of the same flower. So same kind of species can be able to reproduce. Unfortunately, the trees and grasses cannot choose partners. The bees decide on their behalf who to breed with. <laughs> so now let's quickly cross over to Lauren, who's got the leopard. So we've still been following her. We've been following her this whole time. I'm just going to pull up so we can get a nicer view of... Oh, my goodness. Girl, OK. Let's just see if we can catch her walking off there because she keeps... Man, she's so like her mother. And just talking, I did get asked a question earlier about how much she will grow. And if you do think about it, Tandy is also a very small, slender, petite little leopard with a fierce attitude. But still, in size, she is slender. I think she's going to be just like her mother. And, you know, she keeps going off into the thicket and popping back onto the road again, which is ideal for us. Well temporarily ideal for us until she goes off again so i can see that tail can you see just oh, so difficult to see her but you can see that flick of the white tail just heading off there she did just pounce on some birds unsuccessfully so but she seemed to be stalking a flock of birds and then tried to pounce on them and it was a little bit entertaining we're going to follow again okay sorry i've got people talking on my game drive radio i just need to listen because I need to also let them know that she is here. Okay, she's going down here. I don't think we're going to be able to follow that far. Let's see if we can follow her along the road. Okay. She's gone in here somewhere. What I want to do, oh, we're in the shade now. Isn't that great, Craig? Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to see her from here. No, Craig's going to give us a quick scan with the camera. Mm. Alrighty, we have temporarily lost her, but I am not giving up on this one because I'm sure she's just going to pop back out again. She's really given us the run around today. And the fact that she's short in height, she's so much shorter than even Hosanna and Tingana. Alrighty, so we're going to keep searching. We're not going to give up on this mission. And while we do that, let's send you across to Pat. Well, good luck there, Lauren. Well done on finding Salamba, me, you and Trishala, the three ex-trainees all on fire today. <laughs> 
So I am still looking for Tandi. Uh, I've kind of just been looping about really and uh, not really coming up with a whole lot, to be completely honest. Not really coming up with any tracks at the moment, but uh, um, it's been, a, as I said, a very pleasant evening. We have some kudu here. Let's have a look here. So it's here. Hang on, I'll just come in front of this termite mound so Seb can get a clear view. Cool. So it looks like a mother and some young. It's very cool. I don't think I've actually seen a, excuse me, a juvenile kudu before. I don't, I've only ever seen adults. Oh, we've got one right to our left as well. So this is one of the animals that I didn't really see at all up in Kenya. So it's nice to be reassociated with them back down here in Juma. And they were blending in quite well with the dead of the trees. Oh, sorry, sorry. I accidentally scared one in front of me. That's not what I want to do out here. Off it gallops. And I shall leave them to do whatever they were doing. Well, hopefully we can find some other mammals, some carnivorous mammals. But uh, in the meantime, well, just up the road, well, there is a resident that we all know very well called Scuba Steve. Let's check in on his last week. There has been a lot of talk about dropping water levels during the dry winter months. And nowhere is this more evident than at Buffles Hook. In what may very well be Scuba Steve's last week in the watering hole for the season, he did make the most out of every bit of hydration he could get, submerging himself in what is left of the water hole. The heavily receded water levels seemed to make him restless, or was his tossing and turning more related to missing Snorkel Sarah? Now, I do actually feel a little bit guilty every time I hear Scuba Steve's name because, well, it just reminds me of Scuba and that's something that I didn't actually do on my leave was a scuba dive. Unfortunately, I just didn't get around to doing it. And well, as some of you may know, I did start out working for Wild Earth doing dive live. It is definitely a passion of mine being a marine biologist. And after being in the bush for so long, I was actually a little bit, uh, yeah, a little feeling a little bit guilty, a little bit angry at myself for not doing it now, but that's all right. The opportunities will become a plenty as time goes on. So I'm just coming back down to the southern boundary now and revving the engine a little bit too much. And just going to go back. There were some trucks I saw earlier, but they were very hard to kind of draw anything from because well this is where I found her this morning obviously she crossed over and then crossed back as well and before that as well there was also quite a few of other leopard tracks well not a few but it looked to be at least one or two other sets of older leopard tracks so there's a lot of tracks in a very small area which kind of makes it a little bit tricky but I will follow the direction which is pretty much bang on to the west of the tracks that I saw earlier, see if I can pick back up on them and well, hope that they do something for me. And whilst I do that, let's go to the man on foot, Sydney. I'm just trying to get all the signals which is left behind by these very big cats here. As we have seen a lot, the cats coming and spray the scent and after that they even use some of the facial glands in order to put against these trees for communication purposes. Uh, sometimes when wanting to extend territory to someone's territory, they do this. And that serves as a serious provocation sign. Now, let's see what Hukumuri did when he was in this area not long time ago. 
confident Hukumori returned to remind us that Western Juma is his. Yet he remained very much on the border between his and the Duke's domain, the older leopard has clearly left an intimidating scent. His tail indicated truce to the alarming birds. His intimidating steer a picture of concentration. He disappeared to the west and we eagerly await his return. Hukumuri is not the only male in the area, as we all know that uh, there is Tingana, who is also aging every day. Hukumuri and Tingana, they have been seen uh, earlier, I'm not too sure when, in the very same area. And Hukumuri, by the time Tingana was injured, he also introduced himself in the area. So you can see that the chances of Hukumuri to come one day in this side of Juma, much more extending towards the Juma Pen area, they are always very high. The cats... There is no permanent hosting of the territory. The one who is responsible for the territory now is not going to be there forever. Uh, when the other ones are growing and getting more strength, they come and they push them out. We might see uh, Hosanna emerging to come back and take over the very same territory we are talking about. As both uh, Hukumuri and uh, Tingana, they are also growing every day, although they are not of the same age. But uh, Hosanna, considering his uh, nice body and his height and how he is looking after himself, I can promise you, possibilities of seeing him coming back to this area, they are always very high. So you can see the, the, the leaves by the trees, they are getting very much dry at the moment. And this is exposing a lot of birds, as the birds is where they are nesting. A lot of them are boreal. Let's hear more about birds with Rusty. That is pretty impressive. Tingana and Hukamori, they are two massive, massive male leopards and it's going to be interesting to see in the next year or so how that plays out between the two of them. But back to our topic of the migrating birds. So just referring back to the board here, what is the different types of migration? Now we've talked about the steppe eagle and the barn swallow or European swallow. Now the Palearctic is most, some of your bird life that we have talked about, the steppe and your European swallow, they are Palearctic, meaning they go between continents. Uh, so that was basically from South Africa all the way up to the UK and up to Europe, that's where the barn swindle goes. And then up to the, pal to the western, e eastern route where the steppe eagle goes all the way up to China. Russia and Kazakhstan. So that's incredible distance. So that is your Palearctic routes. Then you've got your intra-African migrants. That is from also within Africa. So it's pretty much from either from South, from South Africa all the way to Central Africa or from North Africa down to Central Africa or to Africa. So it's basically all the movement of birds within that Africa continent. And then you've got your altitudinal migrants from high altitude to low altitude, from the low felt to the high felt. Now, why they migrate? The seasons are changing, the whole ecosystem is changing, we just have to try to keep up with it, and the birds know how to do that. It is probably moving faster than they can adapt to, so a lot of birds are dying out and have become quite endangered, even on their migratory routes. Some birds are not even migrating anymore due to our damage. So why migrate one extravagant summer bouquet banquet to another? So that's food. During the summer periods, yeah, you know we get a lot of rain. We, there's plenty of grass. Everything's green and lush. The insect life is it's a bounty. And these birds migrate large distances just for that banquet, just for that food supply. Then also breeding. Now, winter here is not as harsh as it is in a lot of other parts of the world, but it is very cold. So raising chicks here is difficult in those cold climates, but it's also a lack of food because there's no more insects. There is some still around. A lot of birds do stay here and live here year-round, but the food supply runs low. So the birds that stay don't need the competition of the migratory birds that need to travel 
to get out of this area so there's no competition for food. And then weather conditions is what, you know how the climate changes, there's a huge debate about it worldwide, and that affects the migratory routes of a lot of birds, not just a few, we're talking about billions of birds out there that are being interrupted each year through, migrat or through weather conditions, through climate change. Donovan, you're asking how long these journeys takes. Now, some birds can seriously get up some speed and they are done within a few weeks. Some takes months, some just go by weather patterns. So sometimes winter's late, sometimes winter's summer's early. It all depends on weather and they just know how to do it. So we're talking about record. Uh, just say the birds of fame here. I'm just going by general knowledge of what we know about some of the birds here but they can cover like the arctic turn covers 50,000 kilometers from one side of the earth to the other now it's incredible the amount from the northern arctic to the antarctic pack ice it's a huge distance then you got the bear-tailed godwits we don't get them here but it's just talking about how far and how far they will go for their migratory migratory routes it's non-stop for about 80 kilometers per hour they travel 11,600 kilometers from Alaska to New Zealand now that is that is extraordinary then you get the most um, most of the flying bird most of the migratory routes um, migratory birds are mostly waders because water becomes a shortage in a lot of the countries and a lot of places so when the water dries up these birds have to travel and you get some that travel at most fly up at about 2,000 meters high and then you get the waders that are about 2,500 to 300, 3,000 meters, 4,000 to 600 with the raptors. Now, birds of prey, you do know they get it right up there and they can travel larger distances. Then he has a record, and I did uh, this was off Google, and it was a Rupel's vulture that sadly collided with the airplane um, that was traveling at 11,300 meters. Now, that is an astonishing height, even for a bird. But this is probably a freak accident. Somehow that bird still uh, didn't obviously make it. But you're looking at in comparison with Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount, Mount Kilimanjaro stands at 5,895 meters high. Now, that bird was way above there. It's astounding what birds can do. Now, there's, some of these birds have to climb way high up and then slowly but surely come down to their migrate they uh, places where they come in for the summer some go across the land you've got the little flapper uh, we call them flappers but the little birds that go across land uh, closer to the ground and they take a lot more than just a few weeks to get across so it's quite astounding how far these birds will go what triggers migration well that varies as well it's seasons like i said winter summer they all change or they, they pretty much set we've set the boundaries but Mother Earth is changing all the time. So winter is coming later. Is it colder? Is it warmer? It all depends on that. Weather, food, lack of, same thing. There's If it's a bad season, there's not hardly any insects. So some birds don't even get to their migratory spots. They stop halfway. You get mating and breeding. That is also time to travel because now they need to go and repopulate so they need to travel these massive areas to their breeding grounds where it is happens to be yeah inherit like i say the roots it's all done to roots is it inherited is it learned is it instinctual these birds have to some of them follow others some of them you've seen those famous um geese that go in those v shapes they some of those chicks follow them you get some birds like the cuckoos don't have that they don't go in flocks so they have to just find it all on their own it's it's incredible how they do it so it's um, astounding incredible and it's so much to learn and so much we need to still understand about these birds and how we impact them but yeah how we impact them is another ball game but we won't go there so let's talk about our next bird don't does anyone have any ideas of the birds Wahlbergs, we talked about them earlier. Did it stay or did it go? Now, I know since we had Wahlbergs when I arrived here, now they're not here anymore. They have migrated. So, yeah, 
Uh, I did have an answer coming through saying it is missing. Yes, we do not have them here anymore. If they are still around, it'll be a young one that has not kept up with the or haven't, hasn't learned the route yet. But it hasn't been a very cold winter, so some birds don't move. So let's play the Wilbergs video. Now, this is a pale form Wilbergs eagle. It is two, one of two that we know very well in the area. And this pair couple has bred in this area year after year after year. And it has actually a dwarf mongoose in its talons. So yes, they migrate here for the summer and breed here. And then when winter sets in, they head off to Central Africa to their, their sorry, <laughs> they're intra-African migrants. So they come into the central part of Africa where they, they can go north and they have been known to go just below the Sahara Belt and they have been known to breed there as well and then they return to Central Africa for the winter period. Now winter, Central Africa, Kenya doesn't get very cold. It doesn't really have a harsh winter. Most of Central Africa doesn't. So there's a lot of food there throughout the year. But at the peak times, some birds migrate there. These Wahlbergs don't like the competition. They come down to South Africa where there's a lot more food for the young so they're able to breed. Okay, let's get that one out of the way. And then my favorite, has anyone else guessed it? The Woodlands Kingfisher. Is it here or is it gone? Now everyone, most of you know it, the Woodlands Kingfisher has an incredible call. Well, we'll play, just wait for that later. So yes, while we concentrate, go back and look at the Kingfisher later on, let's go over to Sydney on Bushwalk and see what he's getting up to. Right now, looking for these very interesting and best contributors in the ecology and the ecosystem as a whole, the bees. We are now trying to see if we can find you some so that we can enjoy the sightings. These insects, a lot of them are now up in the air. They are now going to collect water and all the necessary requirements for them to survive. Now that we are heading towards winter or we are at the beginning of the winter, they must be having quite a lot of food stored for them to survive. The bees are like any other insects. They are much more active uh, after the sun. When the sun in the morning is getting stronger is when they are going to also get very strong. When it's too cold, you will see they prefer to uh, come close together so that they can insulate. Bees and the termites, they've got the same kind of a social structure, which is called a caste, where there is different departments. You can see now that I am climbing right on top of this very beautiful termite mound. And I want to tell you something. How the termite mound starts is amazing. It's not like how the bees, the hive starts. <laughs> Minamu, thank you very much for such a lovely question. These kind of bees can, can fly for about approximately six weeks. And these six weeks of their lifetime, they have got to travel a lot in search of all the necessary requirements in order to get the life going by the hive. So the bees, they can be able uh, to fly. Each worker can be able to fly for more than 589. And that is quite a lot in terms of the kilometers. So they can cover a very wide range. Their responsibility, the workers, is to go and collect food so that they can come and give to the queen who resides in there, which is the one responsible to lay all these eggs. So the bees are so very much interesting and they can be able to visit quite a lot of different trees and the grasses uh, in every day. So you can see that these insects, their mandate is to make sure that uh, the vegetation is healthy and the vegetation is reproducing. But who get the benefits? You can see, as I indicated at the beginning, that I am talking here today with quite a lot of energy. The energy I'm getting, I'm getting it from the food. The food which has been multiplied because of the contribution of these pollinators. So they are not the only pollinators here by the natural environment. They are being assisted by the butterflies and the birds. But also the wind also play some kind of pollination. So it's quite a collective thing for us to get all this food we are getting at the moment. Elephants, they are getting benefits because they are browsers and they are eating trees. Less bees, less insects, 
less birds, it does hamper the life here by the environment. So now let's quickly cross over to Lurin. A little stuck potentially is the wrong phrase. I think a better phrase is a very, very extremely stuck. Somehow, Follow and Miss Clalamba have managed to break a piece of the car. Yes, that's all we shall say for now. So, on a positive note, at least we got to see a leopard. We, Craig and I worked very hard at tracking Clalamba down. And of course, we found out yet we just managed to break a piece of car. So I'm not in the Maasai Mara anymore, but I do feel like I am because this is, of course, what happens in the Mara when you get stuck. So I'm not going anywhere for a hopefully a short time. <laughs> Who knows how long this is going to take? And I do love Wendy. She's my favorite car. But luckily, I have Batman with me. So hopefully a few Robins or maybe a lot of Robins are going to come and rescue us. And hopefully we can actually get back out there. But for now, we are just more than a little stuck in the wilderness. Which, to be honest, out of everywhere, this is exactly where I would want to be. So I do apologise for you losing Tlalamba. She really did give us such a hard time today, but we managed to keep up with her as fast as we could. So my original plan, without knowing I was going to bump into a beautiful princess, was to, in fact, visit the hyena den, because it's been some days since I have been there. Lots of activity going on. The more time we spend there, the more we actually realise what is going on. There's a hierarchy. There's lots of behaviours that we have to analyse and see what is going on and you never know of course until you actually experience it so i have spent some time there since i've been back and there was a very interesting interaction between heart and ribbon two of the lowest ranking females so let's go and check out exactly what happened to not interfere with a mother suckling her cubs is apparently a memo that heart did not get she seemed set on making sure a proper greeting ceremony was performed with a disinterested ribbon. Hart's persistence did not pay off as Ribbon got up and began investigating her surroundings. With all hyenas, subtle displays of dominance easily turn into vocal scuffles that are important reminders as to who is in charge. Ribbon's hungry cubs having no choice but to patiently wait until mum returns. Wasn't that fascinating? So Ribbon is the lowest rank and she's at the very bottom. Hard is actually more dominant than her, but they are still both low. And of course, there was no aggressiveness here. It wasn't conflict. It genuinely was just Hart being very inquisitive because there was suckling going on, which I seem to feel brings out a reaction in the female mothers and females that are not mothers. And she was trying to initiate a greeting ceremony, which is where two hyenas face each other at the opposite way and lick and sniff one another's genitals and I believe that's what Hart was trying to do but Ribbon was completely disinterested and poor little cubbies who were waiting on suckle time. There's a lot going on with the Juma clan at the minute and I personally love every single minute I spend there but I potentially won't be going there tonight because well we're not going anywhere which is great news. <laughs> I believe we are well a rescue is underway and I'm obviously not alone out here. So hopefully we will be back with you soon enough. But for now, we're going to send you to someone whose car isn't broken and he's driving around. Let's go to Pat. It's not a nice feeling I am feeling for you very hard there, Lauren. I know what it's like to be stuck and waiting for help, especially when you do have big cats there as well and they are out of range of the camera or even just out of sight completely. It is, yes, not a very nice feeling at all. Actually, when I was feeling it in the Murray, it was more so my fault. <laughs> Whereas it sounds like with Lauren, this one is purely mechanical. So I am just going to stop my search for Tandy now. It wasn't really coming up with anything. Um, and so now I'm going to go around and check the pans. Uh, Lauren did say that Tlalamba was heading towards Galago Pan when she did start to break down. 
I think it was something with their steering. And so I'll go and check there. And then at the next line of point in line from there will be at Voyatella Dam as well to see if she's gone that way, perhaps for a drink. It is starting to, well, the sun is actually just about to set. I would say it's at preset at the moment. And so things are starting to cool down. Seb and I were just talking about before how you can really know this, the drop in temperature as soon as the uh, sun disappears somewhere. Okay, well, I'll uh, well, hopefully find something on this little bumble to the pen. And in the meantime, let's go over to Sitters on Foot. I am right on top of the beautiful termite mound. The question is, how did this termite mound start? There is something interesting about this. But before we get to that, I want to introduce you to what has been happening uh, done by one of those animals who are interested to come and just lie on top of this termite mound in order to have a good visibility. Tingana made a dignified appearance, having been scarce for many days. The elusive duke appeared out of nowhere, and it is always special to see and hear him calling. Tingana's voice is probably what alerted this hyena, but as soon as it spotted the duke, it made sure to take a respectful detour. <laughs> it is difficult to saw. I can imagine how his throat is like a Tingana because we have seen him on several occasions doing that, which is a kind of a sign in order for him to introduce himself in his territory to show his level of dominance in this area. It's always nice to hear those kind of beautiful cats doing that. On top of this termite mound, I promise that I will share with you how the termite mound is starting. You must listen very carefully here. When these uh, kind of insects are in the termite mounds, we have got this what is called the alets, the reproductives. The reproductives, if you take them from the termite mound before they come out and fly themselves and you put them close to each other, they are not going to fall in love uh, at each other. What makes them, in order to trigger the stimuli, uh, which makes them to start following each other is the flight. If they don't flight, they're not going to know anything about mating. They only discover something about mating when they're on a flight. That is why under the ground they've been staying together, both male and females, but not knowing that one day they are going to mate. So when they leave the termite mound, when they start to fly, it triggers the stimuli to secrete the pheromone. And this pheromone makes the female to fly, and where she's going to land, the male up by the air is going to pick up the signals and land on the ground, and he's going to go and touch the females. After that, you will see them start chasing each other, and they find a nice hole and dig. Something interesting is going to happen now. When they have got a nest, there are only two, and there are going to be two for a while. Now in here there are millions. The male is responsible in order to fight against the intruder alone. And the female is going to grow the big body size. And when she's growing and lay eggs, the male must have to be responsible. And sometimes he can even opt to die for the sake of this female. And that is why the female don't have any healthy health related problems because they feel very comfortable and protected by this male. If you look at the size of the female, she always looks much bigger. And the male, he looks very much small, as if he is still the same size as he was, he was wedded during the flight. We're going to carry on with this interesting story. Let's cross over back to Rusty. That Tingana is a beaut, and we did have him the other day, and hearing that rasping call, he is a leopard that nobody wants to mess with. He is definitely making it. He's made a name in the area, and he is going to for a while yet. But yes, that's just how it goes. So we are talking about the Wilbergs earlier. Now, I didn't quite mark it on the map. So 
they are in South Africa during the summer and they move to their intra-African migrant and they move to just below the sub-Sahara to Central Africa is where they park off for our winter where it is quite mild there but there's a lot more food source. They do expand further into the Sahara where I where I sorry I do apologize I completely said the wrong information earlier. They don't breed there they just they, they just go and move into that area for further feeding or for the bounty of food that sometimes with good rains gets into that area but otherwise they mostly stay in Central Africa migrating down into South Africa into the southern part of Africa for the breeding season. So the next bird that we were talking about earlier was the Woodlands Kingfisher. Now they are the most exquisite bird we have here, migratory bird, and we know when it's summer. So that's a giveaway. They are not here yet, but in I think in about three months time they will rock up. It's almost on the day you will know when the woodlands arrive because some of us have a bet on the day we see them and my guess is always on the 11th of November and it's <laughs> I've had three woodland kingfisher sightings from one year to the next that arrived almost on the same day in the same garden to breed in the same nesting box so they are into African migrants so we'll just show you a quick video of them and what they look like. Now this one is eating one of our, well, not our dragonflies but a dragonfly and since it comes in the rainy season there are plenty of dragonflies around but in the last four years we have seen a huge drop in numbers due to the lack of rain we've had. We are very dry here we've had not a very good rainy season so the kingfishers do normally come breed here but sometimes they leave earlier than expected. That's just part of what they do. So they are stunning birds and they call our incredible. I love the sound of it. You know that summer is here. Mina Mu, you're asking how to birds prepare for migration. Well that is feeding up. Now they know that sometimes of the year it's it's closing down oh, when the air, for, it's actually everything, the air pressure. Um, if they're on the coastline they believe it or not uh, do it by the moon and the stars. They know what's going on and they read it's stuff that we are still trying to come to terms with and how they know when to migrate but it is up to the weather patterns and how the seasons are changing so you'll know by the end of winter a lot of them start feed at the end of summer they start pumping up feeding up ready for that long long migration wherever they're heading to the woodlands doesn't have far to go but the limited because they are quite iconic bird here but there's a few subspecies found in Africa. This particular woodlands kingfisher starts uh, breeds here in South Africa generally where we are. At this time of the evening they will be calling every 20 minutes or so but they leave South Africa and also go up to Central Africa and they are often found around the Sudan but in war-torn areas so there's not a lot of research done or followed up on them in these areas so it is quite a special trick for them but we can't wait for them to come back because I do love them sometimes they do start calling way too early in the morning and you're just like okay you gotta stop that now you are beautiful but can't happen <laughs> um, yeah um, I've been asked to do a call of the Wing Woodlands Kingfisher I cannot do that there it is an incredible sound but I think we can ask Sydney if he can pull off a Woodlands Kingfisher call. So on that note we can go over and see how his bushwalk is going along and see if he can not only call for the bees but call for the Woodland Kingfishers and see how that goes along. The story I was talking about, these two, which is the king and the queen, the founders of every termite mound. So I was saying... When you look at them growing, and the male is going to remain small, and this male is going to look beautiful as the time when he was...
the male is beautiful, but this male will opt to stay together with this female. He is not going to get interested anymore on any other females. So now, when these kind of two insects are staying together, the female is going to start laying eggs. And after laying eggs, she is going to grow big because the workers who will come out first are going to look after her and they will give her a special diet. Uh, to so this uh, male, this female is going to now grow the big body size and when growing body, big body size she is going to look now like a big worm and it's going to be very difficult for her to move. Uh, she will only move the head and these other ones when they see that the female cannot move anymore they are going to kill her. So the workers will come and kill the queen and they will eat, on, they will feed on that queen and after that they are going to take another queen, potential queen, groom her and, and build another chamber next to that one so that they can then have that one to carry on breeding by uh, uh, laying the eggs in order for the termite mound to survive. So you can see those insects, they are also cannibalist. That is why in, under the ground, if one of them dies, they, they, the other ones will come and check and observe and check the feasibility of feeding on that dead one. They will then bury the dead one, but a few days later, three days later to seven days later, they will come back and eat it. They will bury her for a while, and after that, they will come back and eat it. So the insects are also very much interesting and they just want to recycle everything, including their bodies. <laughs> so they, not only, uh, re they don't only recycle the vegetation, material, all dead body of these plants. Uh, I, I know there is quite a lot of questions about what Sydney is wearing. What I'm wearing here is a traditional dress. This is my traditional dress for quite a long time. When I was going uh, for the competitions at home, when we are playing some dance as boys, this is what I used to wear a lot. And it does, it's two piece. This is the top part. I do have the bottom part. You will see the bottom part uh, one day, but it's the same as this one. The reason for me to wear this is different colors. These colors today, as it is a World Bee Day, is representing the different colors of different flowers. So these are the different colors of different flowers attracting the bees in order to come and pollinate. So that is why today I've decided to honor the bees from all the contribution they are doing towards the survival of the ecosystem. So now let's uh, quickly uh, cross over to Pat, who is uh, searching. He's searching for the beneficiaries of the termites and the bees. Well, we've just gone and checked around the pan and that sort of area and nothing as of yet. And we are just approaching on the dam now. And I am keeping my eyes peeled for Princess Tralamba because that would be absolutely grand to get the mother and the daughter all in one day. But if I don't find her here, I think what I'm going to do is go say g'day to the hyenas if they are out. Hopefully they are out. It's been quite some time since I have seen the Juma hyenas. Obviously I saw, was it June or Ribbon? June or Ribbon, one of them this morning, right before I saw Tandy. But uh, yeah, that was a very, very brief sighting there. And so just coming down onto the dam now. Jalal wants to know why don't leopards form coalitions to defend their territory? Well, leopards tend to be quite solitary because they don't have overly large territories compared to that of, say, a lion pride. And so they don't need so many members and they can, they're can very capable hunters. They don't, they, I mean, they will go for big prey. Don't get me wrong, they will go for big prey. But say, for example, your average or maybe average female impala, that's no real challenge. Well, it is a challenge, but it's uh, something that a leopard, a full-grown male leopard, is very, very capable of, 
of taking down and also because of their mating systems as well. Again, comparing them to lions, it is a little bit different in that the females are also solitary and the territories are kind of inside that of the males. And so also the females will go out in search of males as well. And so, yeah, there's also that difference to consider. And so it's another reason why we won't see leopards in a coalition. They are truly, well, not truly, but almost truly the lone wolves of the cat world. Cheetahs somewhat, but they still do have the coalitions and all of that. Anyway, a topic completely different to coalitions is birds, and that is exactly what Rusty is going to teach you about in the tent. It's a hot. So I was hoping for Sydney to make that the call of the Woodlands Kingfisher, and I think he has still got the bees buzz in him, and the termites are quite fascinating insects but yes I could not get him to make the call so I'm going to play the call of the Woodlands Kingfisher because I would love to hear it and we had a little small competition in the tent just shortly after we went off about who can make the sound so this is the sound of the Woodlands Kingfisher It's an incredible sound. Yes, it does. At early hours in the morning, it does get a bit painful to hear, especially at the end of summer. By the beginning of summer, it is your iconic sound you hear. What you hear in the background, apart from that call, is your, it sounds like yellow billed hornbills uh, who are doing the evening chorus before they go off to roost. It is getting darker here. The sun has set and there is so much still to talk about. With the migrator, migratory routes of birds, it goes on. Nina K, you're asking, is it possible for any of these birds to migrate to the States? Uh, none of our migratory birds that we talk about right now go anywhere to the US. That's a very over the ocean crossing. It does not happen here. There are actually birds that do go from South Africa, they're mostly on the coastline and they migrate across the, we're talking about albatrosses, you're talking about a lot of the uh, sea bird life but not so much your Kruger, Kruger inhabitants, if you want to call them that. They do not migrate that far. They go up north to south because they need to get across land. They need the continuous food source to get from north to south. The seabird life, they rely on food off the ocean, which is fine for them so they can cross these massive distances to get across to the States. So yes, there are birds that are found here in South Africa on the coastline that do migrate to the States. I don't have them offhand, but I did read up about them earlier. This topic can go on for hours. I got so involved in it in the last few days, I just couldn't pack all the information in. So we had to like choose a couple of birds, know what they are and go from there because there is masses and masses amount of birds and going all different directions. So I'm saying there's 500 over, almost 500, even over 500 species of bird within Kruger National Park and 80, more than 80% of them, oh sorry, there's more than 80 species that migrate just out of where we are right now. So we're just working on a few, <laughs> six of them or eight of them, if you want to include the African Spoonbill and the African Harrier Hawk. So are they here or are they gone? That is still the question out there. So we're on to our next bird. We know the woodlands is not here at this present moment. They are somewhere in Sudan or Central Africa filling up on whatever fresh grubs they can find. So we are going to go over to the Deirdrix cuckoo. Is it here or is it gone? Now you know that cuckoos are, they lay eggs in other birds nests. So they are not my favorite birds because was, I think they have got this sussed out. But this is the Deirdrick cuckoo. Now this is a juvenile and he has is snacking on a caterpillar, one of the delights, the delicacies that they have out there. They seem to love them and know, be, uh, are known for hunting caterpillars. 
Now, when they are fully in adult plumage, they don't have the such a distinct bars on them. Now, is it here or is it gone? I think I've already answered that. I'm not too sure. <laughs> but yes, it is, as you can see, the foliage around this Deirdre cuckoo is green and lush. And if we look outside, or have you seen on the drives right now, it is orange, gray, brown. <laughs> so yes, it is a summer migrant. They are also into African migrants, also following the woodlands kingfisher. But they are also, they start in South Africa. They breed here by using other birds' nests as the host. And then they also migrate up to Central Africa and East Africa for the winter period. They do not breed up there. They just head up there for, for greener pastures for the caterpillar bounty that is probably up there. So they are quite distributed all the way up, all actually almost up into the Sahara, into the, where most of the desert extends into. So they are quite a diverse bird species, but not, I actually don't get to see them very often. I hear them, but don't get to see them. They're not the one or the most common cuckoos that are around here. So that is another bird that is sadly not here, but we will wait until summer arrives to have it back. Now, the next bird that we would like to get out there just after we go over to Sydney because it is getting dark and he has to say goodbye. So let's go over to Sydney and see what he's getting up to on Bushwalk. So now the temperatures are dropping at the moment. As you can see, the sun has just gone down. This is, this is their time to go and rest and their time to go and rest is also going to force me in order to go and rest as by the bush walk our camera when the sun goes down is not strong as those ones from the vehicles and thank you very much it was nice having you as part of the bush walk unfortunately uh, due to I'm going to have to disappear it. Now let's go to Patrick while remembering David. All right, so no luck in my search for Trilumba. So you know what they say, third time lucky. Search for Tundi, unlucky. Search for Trilumba, unlucky. Now coming to the hyena den, third time. Hopefully I will be lucky. I am not far from there. Just, well, hopefully I'm not far from there. I haven't actually visited, oh no, yes, no. This is the one I do remember, this hyena den. So they do move around a fair bit. Cool, thanks, Seb. I'm still updating myself with all the what's and where's of Juma at the moment. And sorry. Uh, <laughs> just clothesline Seb with some branches there but all is well so yeah so it's just trying to find my way again well not really my way again but just where a lot of the things are such as these hyena dens spend a bit of time with hyenas up in the Mara not not heaps and heaps Lauren obviously got to know the North Queen quite intimately but um, actually towards the end there when I found their new den site. I did go and check on them quite a bit. I think just because I was a little bit proud of myself for finding that. <laughs> Hyenas though, they do definitely hold a soft spot in my heart. They are a very, very cool creature. And I think it's just because of their intelligence and perhaps their personas as well. They're definitely one of the animals that seem to really put out quite a bit of personality, especially when they are young'uns. Whoop, sorry. At least being here, I've got less chance of being a marshmallow. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, yeah, one of the advantages to being in Juma. 
One man who I have seen joining the Marshmallow Club in the past is Sydney, and he is working at Let's See What He Has Now. I do wish Pat all the luck. It is getting to that special time of the evening where the hyenas are more active, and we know the den site has been the three possible den sites have been overflowing with the youngsters going in and out of all of them so it's very hard to keep tabs of those hyenas but I do hope he has some luck later. Now I do need to apologize like I said I've got so much information out here and I'm getting <laughs> quite sidetracked but back to the Deirdrick cuckoo. They are gorgeous birds but yes they do migrate up to Central Africa but they also go further north uh, just below the Sahara and they also breed along Nigeria and also along Sudan but they they don't breed in the Central African Republic in DRC they are residency in other words they are just filling up socializing doing what birds do best but then they do either they migrate north to just below the Sahara where they breed and also south to South Africa where they breed but they've also been known to go all the way up to Yemen and Amman up here to breed as well and they've also been spotted in Cyprus out of all places so they do get around and like it's not fact we don't always know where the birds are going they could have had a storm got sidetracked ended up in a completely different country it's not always fact that is what the great thing is of today with this technology we have and all the birders out there all the bird lovers have all got apps and phones and they are checking in their phones and taking in new birds that have not seen been seen in that era ever or probably they have been seen but not logged so making all this new information available to us is giving us a clear indication of where these birds are or what they are doing well, there's been incredible sightings of the Mozambican cuckoo which, uh, the Madagascan cuckoo sorry Madagascan cuckoo that has been spotted not far from here and it's one of three sightings made ever in this part of the country so it's been quite incredible to see how much has and now Madagascar is not far is quite far from Africa from the African mainland so how these birds got here they must have covered a quite a, some serious ground or some airspace to get here so what we talk about now is not exactly how these birds are it's a rough or well, not as a guess it because they are being seen <laughs> So yes, these birds are around and they it's not always set fat fact of where or what they're doing. We just know roughly where they are between the summer and winter periods. But while we are going to talk about the next birds later on, let's go over to Lauren, who is still getting herself out of a bit of a situation. Yes, I'm still not going anywhere. I am in the same position, but we may have some technical support hiding under the car right now. So we are working on it, I promise. What a mission. And you know what the frustrating thing is, is I did not get stuck properly once in Namara. And I gloated and I gloated and I just gave Patrick such a hard time because he got stuck a lot. And I come back to Juma and this happens. I can't believe it. But anyway, let's not focus on that. So we have lost Miss Tlalamba, but she's in the same area area that we saw last time and Madonna was actually asking a question about how old Tlalamba is and she is 18 months old which is a real pivotal age for young leopards because it is the age that they go see well they come of independence if you like normally about 11 months old they will start making their first kill alongside their mother and she has reached the age of 18 months where she's off on her own she's in the same area that we saw her and i really do feel that this is sort of the area that she's hanging around for now obviously we did have tingana up near Bufelshoek dam last night Yes, it was last night. The days do tend to run into one here. So I don't think I'm going to get to the hyena den after all. So that plan is out. I think Patrick just checked. However, there was so many more interactions that we had last week that we can still discuss. And one of the key ones that both Jamie and I are really fascinated with right now is in Tima. We're not 100% sure exactly where she fits in. She is Ribbon's daughter. But in this whole hierarchy of the Juma clan, 
She's shown behaviours that don't fit what it should. So let's go and take a look at what Intima got up to last week. Ribbon's daughter, Intima, is at a very interesting age. Being a sub-adult, she often still interacts and plays with younger cubs. Even though rank is not her advantage, size is. In this scenario, one would think the cubs stood no chance against Intima. But one cub came close to winning the spoils. Eventually, Intima's persistence paid off and she walked off with the prize. So yes, it was a really interesting interaction and Tima's at a very, very, again, I'm going to use this word, pivotal age. It's very interesting to see her dynamics with other individuals and with those cubs, it was just play. She was just playing. Obviously, there was a food item, you know, in the middle of the play, but generally she's playing with the cubs. She is bigger than the cubs, but not necessarily higher rank than them. So being the lowest ranker's daughter she should be right at the bottom of the pile. But the behavior she's shown, which we're not confirming just yet, is shown that she could be higher than her mother. So another reason to spend more time at the hyena den, to watch and team up closely and find out exactly what is going on. So that was an incredibly interesting moment. And obviously I was hoping to get back there and check out what is happening of the numerous dens. There's actually three dens in a row, very close to one another, that of course they're all using at the moment, but that is not going to happen and we are here in the thicket with absolutely no leopard or hyena nearby, just some scary tech people under my car. Conrad and Marcel have came to rescue me, so do not worry. While we stay here and we're literally not going anywhere, we are going to send you across to the Marshmallow King himself. <laughs> Hopefully uh, old Conrad and Marcel can get the job done there, get Lauren up and running again. Uh, I think I need an extra vehicle out right now. I'm not having the best luck tonight. Uh, or I've, uh, I've been unsuccessful on all three, so there was no real activity there at the hyena den. We do have a blue wildebeest up here. Apparently Lauren is calling me the Marshmallow King. Thank you for reminding me of my noble title. <laughs> here we go, you're ahead of me here. How are you going? All right, well, I'm going to have a bit of a poke around quarantine, see if there's anything interested in these antelope that are here. And, well, who loves wild dogs? We all do. I'm sure everyone put their hands up. Let's have a look at a clip of them. When there is the rare opportunity to see wild dogs, they're often on the move. As these two from the Investic Breakaway Pack were as well. Because wild dogs traverse such large territories, scent marking is done throughout the areas that they wander. When the job was done, these two were once again on the move. Well, I... Well, some of you may know now that I am in the business of setting goals. I do like to set myself little goals and challenges throughout Safari Live and the drives that I do take. And I think my, my one for while I'm here is before I go and leave again to find a wild dog. Well, not a wild dog. I'll probably honestly be a pack of wild dogs. But to find wild dogs, I think, is going to be my goal for the next four weeks or so for the five weeks and um, yeah, that would be epic because they are an animal I have not seen in so, so, so very long. Ooh, I think probably about five to six months since I have seen the diggity dogs. So hopefully, 
hopefully. The painted wolf. I remember Orly when he, if <laughs> he's first, no, he was on a training drive, that's right. He was being assessed kind of by James in FC and then all of a sudden in the Mara there were wild dogs and he had to go live. So that's kind of the ultimate test. That was a very epic day. I remember being there. Unfortunately, I wasn't on the vehicle with him at the time, but I was very ecstatic to hear that. Uh -uh. Well, let's uh, go back over to Rusty, who, while well, I was speaking about wild dogs, he's got a skull of one for you all to see. Well, since we were on, Pat was on chatting about wild dogs, this. It's amazing being in this oh, this tent here. We've got all sorts of things around me that as soon as we know that we're talking about, it's like, oh, we've got something to relate it to. So yes, that is your wild dog skull. I'm not too sure of the origin of this exact skull, but it is pretty impressive. It's quite a young dog, judging from the teeth. It's a bit chipped, but I think that's from wear and tear of us operating it and manhandling it. But that is one impressive impressive canine and they are ferocious hunters so yes let's leave that be before i get distracted completely away from birds because their information is just there's so much to learn and get on about so yes the deirdre cuckoo we have covered mrs lapwing you're asking do the deirdre cuckoos move because of the rain yes they do it's not necessary to do with the, with the winter and summer. They move with the rains. So yes, they do go in and out and travel out in and out of Kruger. If we don't get a lot of rain here, then neither do we get the Deirdrix. But yes, they do have a set migratory route to go into Central Africa. But yes, they do follow the rains when they come down to us. So we don't get the rains. They go some other parts of South Africa to find where the food is. That's a, with a lot of birds. Although the yeah, migratory routes can, like I said, it's just basic lines we have, basic routes. But where these birds go, well, it's up to them. It could, like I said, they could be thrown off by a storm, by what happens in that area. Do they have enough rain? Is the uh, is the area they or they always went back to? Is it completely taken up by man? Is there a skyscraper in place of the field that they once went to? So that all changes routes and patterns and where they must go next. So there is one big change which I have been told about and that is the white stork, how they are actually now nesting in parts of the Western Cape of South Africa. Now I haven't confirmed or denied that anyone said that about whether or not they've always done that, but it's a case of these white storks normally migrate all the way up to Europe to nest, but these ones are staying year round. Maybe because we have created a habitat for them or maybe because the seasons are just changing. That's a very, it's a very broad um, topic about that. So our next bird is, is it here or is it gone? Is it, uh, we are talking about the Levalence cuckoo. Also, uh, not my favorite bird out there, what they do with the <laughs> laying the eggs in other birds' nests. Now, is the Levalence cuckoo here or is it gone? That is very the same as the Theodrix. It is not here at the moment. It is also a inter-African migrant and it is also in Central Africa, the same route where the Theodrix goes to. But it does cover more of the eastern part of Africa, so you'll find them as we speak up in either Central Africa and parts of Eastern Africa. But that is also a rough guesstimate because it depends on where the rains are and how the weather is up there where they have their stuck to their parts of Central Africa or they're actually in East Africa as well. So let's just play a short clip of the Levalence Cuckoo so you get a picture of what we're talking about. There are two of these birds that look very similar to each other and they are sometimes quite complicated. Tris, 
trips. Am I getting this name right? You're asking, are all the birds migrate? That is a trick question, and we're going to go into it into more detail just after this levalence. Now, yes, <laughs> that is a trick question. There's two more birds to play, and I want to know if they are here or if they are gone. So, yes, so far, the ones we've talked about have migrated, but this one, the African spoonbill, is it here or is it gone? What happens? during winter where does this bird go now it is one of my favorite birds as well when it comes to waterfowl they do depend mostly on the water systems and so that's also a trick question because they love water do they only stay around when there's water or do they move do they migrate are the inter african migrants do they fly those thousands of kilometers and travel all the way to europe I think that's up to you to decide. The next bird I would like to show you is <laughs> another one that's quite, it's called the African Harrier Hawk. Now this bird definitely has a few tricks up its sleeve. And if any of you have seen it in the past, they are incredible hunters. Now do they, are they here are they present during our winter periods or do they move off to greener pastures judging from its feeding behavior right now or what it's looking for believe it or not it is actually hunting right now we do have a mobbing it looks like a violet back starling but they are are they here or are they not you know the drill either go onto the youtube chat stream and send in those answers or the Instagram, pretty, sorry, I completely got distracted there by the question. The African Harry Orc, is it here or is it gone? We will just cut that off for now. So yes, send in those answers and we'll get back to you later on, just before the end of the show. So the African Spoonbill and the Levalen, and sorry, and the African Harry Orc. Celtics, you're asking if we get the intra-African migrants in the Mara. Yes, you do. You do get some of our migrants, intra-African migrants, moving up all the way from South Africa into Kenya, Tanzania, into East Africa. So yes, you do get some of our migratory birds up there. The exact ones, well, that is for another day because if I start talking about birds, I am not going to stop right now. We have got a few more topics with us. So yes, the Levalence is also in Central Africa right now. And we want to know if the African Spoonbill and the African Harry Hawk are here or are they gone? Let us know. So while, we, while you decide whether or not that's the case, let's go over to Pat and see how his, his, how his evening is getting along. All right, well, now I have switched to just looking about, just looking about, just having a suss, having a squiz, having a dig about. I, um, yeah, I'm hoping to see a creature of the night, you know, something really cool like a chameleon or perhaps something that I was just thinking before that I really should have seen by now and I'm quite uh, quite annoyed that I haven't seen is a bush baby because it's not like they're I mean they are uncommon but it's not like they're extremely extremely rare like say a pangolin and yet I have yet to see one in the flesh obviously I've seen on many drives sitting in FC and sitting watching other people on drives that I've seen them find one but I have not been able to locate myself one so I am looking at through the trees and um, yeah hopefully finding a chameleon or a bush baby or something cool and something that uh, yeah something that I don't often see here at Juma it's kind of a new time to be here for me uh, here in Juma it's uh, I have been here, what, in summer towards the start and then also kind of midsummer as well. So, yeah, it's a completely new time for me to be in Juma. New set of animals. 
and well new set of birds as well So I've seen something just up here. I'm just going to move a little bit closer and see what it is. It looks to see be something on the ground. <laughs> I mean, if we're going by chance, I'm guessing that it's going to be, or what it's most likely to be, is a scrub hair. But, oh, we never know what is that. Ah, it's a night jar. Okay, we can look at that. Oh, <laughs> ah, of course you're going to do that. Of course that's going to happen just as we went to put it on camera. I think that one was a fiery night jar. Something that we would, someone, one that we would constantly be on the roads in the Mara. Now, I wonder if night jars migrate or not. Let's go back over. Oh, sorry, I was about to link there, but I don't think I was supposed to. I think I was hearing things wrong. Oh, okay, no, I can't look to Rusty, sorry. Sorry about that, everybody. Let's go over to Rusty. Well, I do have Pat. Hope Pat has a bit of luck later on. But we are going to move back to oh, my work of art. <laughs> Not that work of art, this work of art. It gets quite technical. But yes, so if any of you, remember, those African spoonbill, is it here or is it gone? Is it present or is it not? Where is it during our winter periods? The same with African hairy hawk, Gymnogene. These two names, some people use either or. Are they here? Is it present or is it gone for better, better uh, for greener pastures? So let's go back to the beginning. We've done the steppy eagle, Paleotic. It's gone up the western part of Africa into Russia, China area. We've also got the Paleotic, the barn swallow, the European swallow has gone on the eastern route. They have all gone, oh sorry, the, <laughs> got it wrong again. The steppy eagle's gone on the eastern route up to Russia, Kazakhstan, and then the barn swallow, European swallow, has gone to the western part of Europe. And that is where they are, as we speak, nesting and building the nest, waiting for the summer to end where we will have them back. Then you got the inter-African migrants, which were the uh, the Wahlberg's eagle, the Levadon's cuckoo, the Deirdrick's cuckoo, and why am I missing one in my head? I can't forget to remember all these birds now. I've been talking about them. So the altitudinal migrants go from high felt to low felt, vice versa, depending on the rains and what is happening in the area at the time. So, so yes, Woodlands Kingfisher, thank you very much. <laughs> I knew there was one missing, and it is one of my favorite ones. So why migrate? One extraordinary, uh, extravagant summer banquet, banquet to another. It's just for food. There's a lot of competition for food in the winter here. There's a lot of birds that stay here, and they are causing quite a bit of a rift. So those birds that do migrate need to do it for food purposes. And also for breeding, they need to get up to the northern part of Af or northern part of Africa into the other continents to breed. Then you got also the weather conditions. If it gets too cold here, a lot of the chicks, a lot of incubation periods does not happen. So they need to move for fall when the weather changes. Some birds get trapped here, some die in the winter. What was also quite interesting was where is it? The captive birds. Now, I read a short article about this the other day when captive birds, sadly ones that have been hit by vehicles and have survived, or birds that there was a big problem a few months, about a month ago with uh, one of the uh, eastern red-footed kestrel, I think it was, 
there is another name for it. They were caught in a horrible hailstorm and now they are migratory birds. But they were caught in a horrible hailstorm and there was a lot of helpers to pick up these birds off the roads. It was in a suburb that they were found. They were roosting in the trees in a suburb and this hailstorm hit and all these birds were knocked out. Now these birds have to be put into captivity. It is human, a lot of human interaction there sadly, but we try to do our best because these birds have a long way to go and they go through a lot of trouble trying to get to their breeding grounds. But these um, birds of prey needed to be looked after. So some are still in captivity that, as we speak and they are getting very restless because this is that time of the year where they should be gone out of here. But because they're not healthy enough and fit enough to do that migratory route, they are being kept back. A lot of them were released. Paul, how does, sorry, my <laughs> questions are coming, but I'm battling to hear them. Did anyone get that? No, again, sorry, you can't repeat that. Climate change. climate change. Paul, you're asking if climate change interrupts their migratory routes. Yes, climate change is playing. Paul. Paul, how would my uh, how would climate change affect migration? Well, climate change does affect them because it's happening quicker. Whether that's a natural cycle, we don't. I don't want to get into that. Now, these birds need to find. There's less rain happening in some parts. There's more rain happening in some parts. There is extreme drought. There's a lot of things changing throughout the world that where these birds should be migrating to to find more food, they're not. So they are changing their route patterns into different parts of the country or different parts of the world. So it is causing quite a bit of effect. It's quite slow going at the moment, but as the years progress and climate change becomes more of a more of a problem, we will be seeing quite severe uh, route, pat uh, route changes with a lot of the birds. So what triggers it? Season, weather, lack of food, mating and breathing. We have covered that. The roots, how do they know where to go? Is the same thing. Inherited, uh, they know it from their parents. Some know it's just time to move on. A lot of geese are like that. Learned, it might be they've just done it a year from year. They follow their parents, they come back, they've raised their young. They've done it a year before, so they do it again. So it's an inherited Thing. It's things sure, yes, the cuckoos, they don't have parents to follow, they're on their own when they leave the nest. So after they've been left, they've got to find their own route and it just seems to be an instinctual behaviour. So how they navigate also fascinates me and that is that is also a topic that can go on for hours and hours. They have their own highly complex internal navigation system. It's a combination of both physical cues such as landmarks and the position of the sun and stars. Now we know a dung beetle story, They can the dung beetles are the ones that roll the balls, dung balls, they can navigate with the stars. I've never quite how under, seen or understood that. I've just read it up and I was like, wow, that's interesting. But birds, I've seen birds migrate at night. The abdomen stalks we get here, they come all the way from Europe or the Central Africa when they come down for Christmas. They, I've seen them flying at pitch black. And I've just seen them coming over the house on the farm in Zimbabwe years ago. So they must be able to move. And there were thousands of them coming over. Well, that's an exaggeration. It was hundreds. But they are covering distance at night. So they must use, as I said, landmarks, stars, moon, sun, all these natural abilities. But yeah, the ability to take Earth magnetic fields, biometric pressures and cues. So yes, they read tidal patterns. Some parts of the world, yeah, the tides do come in and out, but they know how to we know when the water temperatures change. The magnetic fields are going all the time. That doesn't really change much, so that is something that's been around longer than we have. So they know how to follow those routes. Also, yeah, that's pretty much on that. But there is, it's like I said, there's still so much to learn about this phenomenon. Well, it's a twisty word. So yes, it does get very complex and there is so much to follow up on that. So while we are <laughs> reading more about this, let's go over to Pat and see what he is getting up to on this evening's drive. So we have a animal here. It's not quite the carnivore I search, was in search for earlier, but it is a very cool one indeed. A canid and it is a black-backed jackal. 
So we saw plenty of these up in the Maasai Mara and they really did grow on me. Sorry, I think I've just got the windscreen wipers on here. I can hear a bit of a funny noise. And yeah, they just, I think it was their bravery and their, their cheek would just go for anything. I saw five of them chasing off two cheetah from a kill. So it was five, five jackals two cheetah now afterwards some hyena came in and then things really got interesting but just to see five small animals <laughs> how embarrassing <laughs> to see five small animals taking on two big cats i mean cheetahs you know definitely aren't the biggest of the big cats by any means but at the same time the efforts that the jackals put in to get them away was i think quite admirable and they all did at least get themselves a little piece of gazelle in the end. And yeah, that's actually, I think, to be honest, that's the first one I've ever seen in Juma. As I said, I saw plenty and plenty in Kenya, but yeah, that's the first South African blackback jackal I've seen. So cool, very cool. There's also plenty of impala. There's just something about the area I'm in, quarantine, which some of you may know. It's one of the main kind of areas outside of our camp. And it's a kind of open space. Impala always seem to gather here at night time, perhaps for safety in numbers. I was here, of course, at last time for the Impala lambing season when they were all giving birth. So it's good to be here for rutting season. The, the kind of the time where it all starts, where all the males are trying to pass on their genetics to the females. And I guess, I mean, it would still, I definitely think it's more of an advantage to predators during lambing season because the lambs are an easy target, but also two males fighting are an easy target as well because they're obviously quite distracted. Okay, well, I'll just uh, keep poking around here for a little while longer and leave the rust bucket to speak to you about his birds. <laughs> So, we were talking about the African Spoonbill and the African Harrier Hawk. Are they here or are they gone? I'm sure some of you have guessed this. I know one or two of you, or actually more than that, know this already. The African Spoonbill is still around, but it does follow the rains. But at this time of the year, there is plenty of there is water around, but there is getting less and less of water. So a lot of the fish and uh, crabs and stuff it eats is getting more concentrated so they are around so they have not disappeared anywhere yet and then also your african harrier hawk they are around we have seen one i saw a juvenile yesterday for a brief moment so they are around this winter they don't go anywhere they don't have a they do have a particular time of year they breed but it's all within this area so those are around for those who got it right Congratulations. Those two are still around and I'm sure we'll pick them up on drive in the next few days. So it's been pretty, pretty amazing. There is so much to learn about these birds and so much they can teach us. The migratory route patterns are changing yearly and our Ian, you're asking if birds get confused over direction. Younger birds, I believe, do. They can sometimes get thrown off track or they just don't know the route well enough and they can get put off. Weather plays a big role in that and they could land up in a country completely in a different area where they're not used to. So yes, it's all a learning curve. Some of them do do very well. Some of them end up dying, dying in those areas in the other countries where they end up. So it's, it's luck of the draw. If it's survival of the fittest for a lot of these birds. Once they know the pattern and they become an adult and then use the same route, then it becomes an, not an easy task. It's a very long way around for all these migratory birds. And it becomes very complicated and tough when it hits, especially over the harsher areas and especially when they've got these long distance flights that go over the oceans. You got, you, sometimes you go even get a chance to land. So these 
thousands of kilometers these birds fly and even the European roller that's been that was tagged from all the way from Nibia up to Italy to a nesting box and back again that reached over 100 kilometers per hour at one time so it's there's so much research being done and so many people people out there that are trying to get information so if you are interested in birds please help us out and all those out there but it's been a fantastic evening and i've really enjoyed going through and learning everything about migratory patterns of our birds and thank you very much for playing the game well we'll see you all tomorrow for the sunrise safari and thank you very much Thank you.